Before Hollywood would make his name known across the world, and before Stuart Lake's book would secure his legend in the imagination of Americans, if somebody wanted to learn about Wyatt Earp, then they would have to turn to periodicals, like newspapers and magazines. Thankfully, several newspaper interviews with Wyatt Earp exist, and his words were saved in print. This video will show three quotes from those interviews. On August 2, 1896, the San Francisco Examiner published an interview with Wyatt Earp with the title, How Wyatt Earp Routed a Gang of Arizona Outlaws. The bulk of the article is devoted to Wyatt Earp's time in Arizona. However, after a brief introduction, he starts his story by talking about Doc Holliday. After describing their first meeting in Fort Griffin, he relates how Doc and Big Nose Kate escaped the town and came up to Dodge City. It was then that Wyatt gave his personal opinion of his friend. Such then was the beginning of my acquaintance with Doc Holliday, the mad, merry scamp with heart of gold and nerves of steel, who in the dark years that followed stood at my elbow in many a battle to the death. He was a dentist, but he preferred to be a gambler. He was a Virginian, but he preferred to be a frontiersman and a vagabond. He was a philosopher, but he preferred to be a wag. He was long, lean, and ash blonde and the quickest man with a six-shooter I ever knew. It wasn't long after I returned to Dodge City that his quickness saved my life. One wrong fact stands out in Wyatt's description. Doc Holliday was not a Virginian. He was from Georgia, specifically Griffin, Georgia. The possibilities are either Wyatt did not remember correctly, or that it was the mistake of the newspaper man interviewing him and writing it down. Later that month, on August 16, 1896, the San Francisco Examiner published another interview with Wyatt Earp, this time titled, Wyatt Earp's Tribute to Bat Masterson, the Hero of Dobie Walls. Wyatt Earp and Bat Masterson had worked closely together during their time as lawmen in Dodge City, and a strong friendship had formed. In this interview, Wyatt gave his opinion of Bat Masterson. His fame as the hero of Dobie Walls and the slayer of Sergeant King had preceded Bat to Dodge, and he attracted no end of respectful attention as he limped from one gambling house to another, still pale and weak from the effect of King's bullet. Bat was somewhat of a dandy in those days, but before all else, he was a man. Not that his physique entitled him to attention beyond other men, for in his case nature had packed a big consignment of dynamic energy into a small compass and corded it up tight, but there was something in the way his bullet-shaped head was mounted on his square shoulders, something in the grain of his crisp, wiry hair, something in the tilt of his short nose that bespoke an animal courage, such as not every man is endowed with all. Mere animal courage has made many a man a brute and an assassin, but Bat Masterson had a wealth of saving graces which shone from the honest fullness of his face. I have already spoken of his eyes. They were well-nigh unendurable in conflict, so bold, so bright, so unmitigable was their gaze, but in moments of peace they danced with mischief, with generosity, with affection. A small and carefully nurtured coal-black mustache half hid a mouth which was readier to soften in mirth than to harden in anger, and the stubborn chin beneath was cleft with a dimple that physiognomists interpret as the symbol of a kindly heart. It was Wyatt Earp's friendship with Bat Masterson that would help grow his legend. Once, when President Theodore Roosevelt was talking to Bat Masterson, the president told Bat that he should write down his life story. Bat Masterson replied, Mr. President, the real story of the Old West can never be told unless Wyatt Earp will tell what he knows, and Wyatt will not talk. This quote would motivate Roosevelt's press aide, Stuart Lake, to contact Wyatt and publish Wyatt Earp, Frontier Marshal, in 1931. In 1882, following the Earp Vendetta ride, Wyatt Earp and his brother Warren left Arizona to go to Gunnison, Colorado. It was here that both Warren and Wyatt were interviewed by the Gunnison Daily News Democrats. 
The interview was published on June 4th, 1882. From the interview, we learn about Wyatt's frame of mind following the conflict with the Cowboys, although the interviewer described Wyatt as being cautious as to what he said. I promised my brother to get even, he said, and I've kept my word so far. When they shot him, he said the only thing he regretted was that he wouldn't have a chance to get even. I told him I'd attend to it for him. I shall stay here for a while. My lawyers will have a petition for a pardon drawn up. Everybody in Tombstone knows that we did nothing but our duty. Anyway, I'd do it over again under like circumstances, and all the best people there will sign the petition. Governor Pitkin knows the facts pretty well and will sign it too. We look for a pardon in a few weeks, and when it comes, I'll go back. But if no pardon is made, I'll go back in the fall anyway and stand trial. I'd go now, but I know we would have no show. They'd shoot us in the back, as they did my brother. I'm going to run for sheriff this fall. Behan knows he can't get it again, and that's what makes him so hot towards me. I hear the gang is breaking up, and a good many are going to other parts of the country. I sold out my place, but we have some mining property back there yet. Doc Holliday is in Pueblo now, and he may come over here. The pardon would never come for Wyatt Earp, his brothers, or Doc Holliday. He would not return to Tombstone, and no trial would take place. Wyatt's hopes of running for sheriff against Johnny Behan would never materialize, and the Earps' investments and in mining property would be sold off for taxes. Wyatt had escaped Arizona with his life, and with a story to tell, a story that is still told today.